but I do. Here was the first show that allowed the generation gap that had appeared at this point in time when pro civil protest, rock and roll, and dope, all of it arrived at the same time. Somehow at this show, parents went because they wanted to understand their kids, kids went because they wanted to show their parents what it was. It filled that gap very, very well. Every singer, dancer, hippie, a panther, you name it, we were all online waiting to audition for the show. And we went into a series of rehearsals like I'd never seen before, unlike any other theatrical show I think I've worked on. We did a lot of exercises dealing with caring for one another, loving one another, in order to be loving to the audience. With its downtown run completed, the show moved first to a disco club called The Cheetah, and then, with new director Tom O'Horgan at the helm, Hare moved to the Biltmore Theatre. Drug use, obscene language, a cast intermingling with the audience, and frontal nudity were all central to Broadway's newest hit. I think it affected a lot of people. People still come up to me I mean, and say that it changed their life. But I don't know if it changed Broadway very much. I mean, we had our little day in the sun and then we retired. Hair ran on Broadway for four sold out years. Along with its enduring hit songs, the show helped to establish the world of off Broadway and Joe Papp's public theater as important new players in the development of the commercial musical. Another hundred people just got off of the train and came up through the ground while another hundred people just got off of the bus and are looking around It's a city of strangers. Some come to work, some to play. A city of strangers. Really wasn't until Steve Sondheim came along with company that somebody was able to take all the stuff that had happened before the Rodgers and Hammerstein influence, the director influence, the choreographer influence, all that stuff, and morph into something new that sort of said, okay, that's that. Now, now we're into another. By the end of the 60s, Stephen Sondheim had collaborated on six Broadway shows. He followed up his lyric writing for West Side Story with another landmark, Gypsy, and then wrote both music and lyrics for a string of shows, including A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. In 1970, Sondheim teamed up with Hal Prince on Company, and plunged the musical into a new era. I wanted you to read them because I thought... The show was based upon a group of short plays by George Firth, which dramatized the realities of married life in New York City. It's the little things you do together, do together, do together, that make perfect relationships. The hobbies you pursue together, savings you accrue together, looks you misconstrue together, that make marriage a joy. The company does deal with upper-middle-class people with upper-middle-class problems. Broadway theater has been, for many years, supported by those people. They really want to escape, and uh, here we're saying, bring it right back in their faces. What they've been trying to, what they came to a musical to avoid, they suddenly find facing them on the stage. It's not so hard to be or four times.
In addition to the provocative subject matter, Sondheim and Prince also challenged the audience by deconstructing the storyline of the musical. Probably the major thing, uh, the Meg Company controversial, was that it, there was no plot. The audience kept waiting for a plot. We played with nonlinear storytelling. Obviously, I had preceded it with Cabaret, which was both linear and nonlinear. Now we made, made our way right into a whole nonlinear evening. The notion of a series of snapshots in a man's life taking place in a metaphysical birthday party, and it keeps changing and flowing back and forth, and you don't know if the guests know each other, and there's a girl in a bridal gown, and it's all very weird. Pardon me, is everybody here? Because if everybody's here, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate you going even more. I mean, you must know there's a better thing to do and not a word of it to call. I'm Paul, you know the man I'm going to marry, but I'm not because it wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. Thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all. Now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul that I'm not getting married today. The cast of company inhabited an abstract urban world and rode a working elevator within Boris Aronson's Jungle Gym set. The show's songs did not emerge from scenes as in traditional musicals. Instead, they provided commentary on the characters or their situations. All the numbers in company are inserted like nuts into a fruitcake. They're inserted into the scenes or they occupy, as in the case of Barcelona, the whole scene. But none of them just arises out of dialogue the way, you know, I'd been trained to do by Oscar Hammerstein. Where are you going? Barcelona. Oh. Don't get up. Do you have to? Yes, I have to. When Company opened in April of 1970, its cynical view of modern relationships and marriage polarized the Broadway audience. Musicals for decades have had no doubts about if you find the right person, you may go through the rocky road of love, but it would always lead to a so-called happy ending. We were saying something ambiguous, which is actually there are no endings. It keeps going on is what really Company's about. Broadway was always about fun, about joy, whereas the city was a plaything for Gershwin. In Sondheim's world, it's a place where you lose things, where you can't find yourself, where you're alienated, where another hundred people come out of the subway. So it's an ambivalent ending. But I think to the extent that those endings are earned, they are more mature and more interesting to sing about. Oh, well. I guess, okay, what? I'll stay. They still want a happy ending. And a happy ending can have a lot of people dead like West Side Story, but it's still a happy ending. By the early 70s, New York City, like the rest of America, was in a deep recession, and nowhere was that more evident than on the Great White Way. This area in the 70s was a sewer. This was the den of pornography, prostitution, felony crime, drug dealing, you name it. What Broadway needed was a hit. This time, it would come not from a big time star, but from the supporting cast, the dancers, the self-titled gypsies who provided the backbone of a musical. Chorus dancers on Broadway are blue-collar workers. It's a life commitment, and it's something that either you have inside of you and you have to do it, or maybe you should go sell hamburgers instead, because it's, it's, it's not for sissies, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> It was a former gypsy who reinvigorated Broadway, making dance so popular that leg warmers became a fashion statement. Michael Defelia first appeared in a touring company of West Side Story, but on Broadway, he became known as Michael Bennett. I met Michael on Hullabaloo, a TV variety show, in 1964.
one day we're dancing side by side and we're bringing the jerk to new heights. And I say, Michael, what are you going to do when you grow up? You can't keep doing this the rest of your life. Did you ever think of that, huh? And he said, yes, I'm going to be a choreographer. And I went, oh, that, good luck. Don't forget about me. Bennett got his first job choreographing on Broadway in 1966. He went on to stage dance numbers in Company and, with Hal Prince, co-directed Sondheim's next musical, Follies. In 1973, Bennett began to work on his own show. Without any pre-existing story, he held a series of workshops where he tape-recorded dancers talking about their experiences. When we started a chorus line, it was called The Dancer's Project, and it was a secret. We would start every day with a blank page, um, and our lives were a part of, of the process. You know, this was the first time there was such a thing as a workshop, and we were young guys, and we were all just desperate to put on something very special, very new. All we talked about is let's do something on Broadway like they've never seen before. Again. With backing from Joseph Papp, Bennett spent an unprecedented 18 months developing the musical. A plot line emerged about dancers auditioning for a part in a new show. Back on X wing, turn, turn, out, in, jump, step, step, kick, kick, leap, kick, touch. Got it? Going on. A five, six, seven, eight, a turn, turn, touch. In the beginning, there was a very difficult balance between making this about dancers but not making this about dancers. A five, six, seven, eight, a turn, turn, touch, down. At what point can you get away from the dancer metaphor and get into the world of we're all on a line? We're all in this together. Who am I anyway? Am I my resume? So many faces all around. And here we go, I need this job, oh God, I need this show. That did not happen until one day in rehearsal that Michael Bennett took a chalk and went wham and drew a line on the floor. And he said, that's the line, we're all on the line. Well, now the common denominator of all these people is, God, I hope I get it. I hope I get it. But da 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 I'll never make it. I'll never make it. He doesn't like the way I look. He never likes the way I look. He doesn't like the way I Everyone has dreams and hopes, and there was something in that show for everybody. Men who are just retired would write me letters and say, your character made me go out and start a new business. Football players would say, the line. They would talk about the line, being on the line. Most dramatically, for the show's finale, Bennett transformed a classic Broadway kick line into a bittersweet comment on the life of a dancer. an entire, you know, two hours talking about these individual people and that all this torture they have to go through to get a job, to be on Broadway, is to be in an assembly line. That was the genius of Michael. He gave the audience what they expected. What he meant was something else. Chorus Line opened at the Public Theatre and quickly moved to the Schubert on Broadway in July of 1975. It stayed there for over 15 years, breaking all existing box office records. Michael Bennett and the Chorus Line totally changed the musical theatre. 
It really saved the financial fortunes of the Schubert organization. It was a catalyst for the improvement of this area. And of course, this area now is the most desirable area in New York. I saw a chorus line at the Schubert Theater in Chicago. I was in the last row of the last balcony. I saw the show. I went back to my dancing school, to my teacher, and I said, you've got to teach me to do turn, turn, out, in, jump, step, which was in the opening combination. Two years later, I auditioned, I got the show, and I went on tour with the show. And when I went on the first time, and I was doing the opening combination, and I remember thinking to myself, I wonder who's in the back row. True story. At the same time a chorus line was moving to Broadway, a new musical was staged by another dancer-turned-director, Bob Fosse. The winner is Bob Fosse! In 1973, he became the only person ever to win the Triple Crown of Directing. The Emmy Award for Liza with a Z, the Tony for Pippin, and the Oscar for Cabaret. Being uh, characteristically a uh, pessimist and cynic, this and some of the other nice things that have happened to me in the last couple of days may turn me into some sort of hopeful optimist and ruin my whole life. Fosse was a show business veteran. He began dancing as a child in an act called the Riff Brothers and worked his way up to dance both on Broadway and in Hollywood. When I first met him, he auditioned uh, to, to be a dancer in the movies, and he had no idea he was going to be a choreographer. And in my opinion, he was going to be as good a, a song and dance man as, as Kelly and Astaire. I thought, Fosse, this guy is going to be it. Fosse's distinctive style was evident from the first musical he choreographed, The Pajama Game. While working on his next production, Damn Yankees, he met Gwen Verdon and ended up creating five shows for her. Verdon became the quintessential Fosse dancer, and in time, his wife as well. Arp. Who's got the pain when they do the mumbo? Who's got the pain when they go arp? Who's got the pain when they do the mumbo? I don't know who do you. He loved, loved women. Uh, he loved to make them look beautiful. I think Gwen was the sexiest of them all because she had this angelic innocence about her. Hey. Hey. Over the next two decades, Fosse refined his signature style. I suppose if you repeat something enough times, it's called a style, you know. I started with hats because I began losing my hair very early. And I've always been slightly round shoulder, and so I started to exaggerate that. And I don't have what the ballet dancers call a turnout. So I started turning my feet in, and I guess that's the style they talk about. When you see his work, you know immediately that it's Fosse. Like if you see a Picasso, you know that it is Picasso. The, the lowering of the, the shoulders, the curved shoulder, the small pair of his work. In 1975, Fosse created a musical out of a Prohibition-era story of corruption and murder. He turned to the composing team of Kanda and Ebb, and together they beefed up its show business elements. Fosse's most enduring work for Broadway would be called Chicago. They asked me if I knew how to adapt, because uh, it was a very straight play, if I had any ideas of how to musicalize it. 
And so I came up with the vaudeville uh, concept. While Chicago was set in the past, the show sharply satirized an America obsessed with murder, sex, and celebrity. The lawyer, Billy Flynn, will do anything for a buck, but claims otherwise. I don't care about expensive things, cashmere coats, diamond rings don't mean a thing. All I care about is love, that's what I'm here for. He's a phony, and he comes out and sings a phony song about a phony emotion, and he doesn't mean it for a minute, and you can tell. But all I care about is love. That's what he's here for. Ba 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 It's an indictment of our pop culture, really. All I care about is love. Chicago had a style of black humor. It's almost like cabaret. There's a lot harking back to vaudeville and to burlesque, uh, but always with that cynicism. When Chicago opened in 75, it got very mixed reviews. Now the show is looked on as some sort of icon. And the fact is, it's the same music, the same text, the same lyrics, the same orchestrations. People went in expecting to see a, a vaudeville, you know, a happy thing, and it was very dark. I don't think the public was really ready for it. And of course, it opened five days after Chorus Line, which made it very tough <laughs> on the reviews. And it, like I say, it was a little ahead of its time. We see his legacy living today. We see it in the film Chicago. We see it in the show Fosse. We see it everywhere. You see it in fashion, you see it on television, you see it in commercials. <laughs>